Early on in the 2015 film Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, series protagonist and Impossible Mission Force agent extraordinaire Ethan Hunt steps into a record shop in London called The Vinyl Offer. The woman working there informs him that they're about to close and they start going back and forth in a sort of call and response of different passphrases until she hands him a record that will give him his next mission. And as he goes to the listening room to hear it, the woman goes off book to say, It really is you. I've heard stories. They can't all be true. I always enjoy moments like this in stories when a character seems perfectly set up for a cool or interesting line, but instead says nothing. I think it speaks to the notion that the person writing a character knows them so well that a line of dialogue becomes unnecessary. Nothing needs to be said for the feeling to be understood. All you need is a nostalgic, proud smile. And what's most interesting to me about this is how with a character like Ethan Hunt, something like that feels nearly impossible. Since 1996, almost 30 years ago now, Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt has been trekking on with such a consistency of effort and passion that other long-running action franchises could only dream of. And yet, the films and the character of Ethan Hunt are anything but consistent, with the franchise almost defined by its constantly changing visual styles, its wildly conflicting tones, and most importantly for my purposes, its completely distinct versions of one Ethan Matthew. Hunt. So today, I want to explore those differences and figure out how a character who seemingly changes his whole personality between movies can somehow say nothing and still be understood. And I think the best way to start looking at that is to get a good idea as to who all of these different Ethans are. But first, let's hear from this video's sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is a men's grooming and hygiene brand trusted by more than 8 million men worldwide, and I was sent their Performance Package 4.0. There's the Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer featuring a cutting edge ceramic blade designed specifically to reduce grooming accidents, a 4000K LED light for more precise shaving, and it's waterproof so you can do the work in the shower and not worry about having to sweep up hair from your bathroom floor. Then there's the Weed Whacker 2.0 nose and ear hair trimmer created with a proprietary technology to help reduce nicks, snags, and tugs, and Finally, there's the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray, which gives you a cooling aloe vera spritz for a quick refresh whenever needed. The Performance Package 4.0 also comes with two free gifts, the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxers, which are probably the softest boxers I have ever had, and the Shed Travel Bag for when you're on the go but you don't want to skimp on hygiene. You can get all this and more by clicking the link in the description or going to manscaped.com where you can use promo code STORYSTREET at checkout for 20% off plus free international shipping. That's 20% off plus free shipping with promo code STORYSTREET at manscaped.com or use the link in the description. Thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video, and now back to talking about the many faces of Ethan Hunt. Identity has always been a strangely present theme throughout the Mission Impossible series. Look no further than the series' love of masks and disguises, pretending to be people that you're not. In this way, Ethan has literally had many, many different faces throughout these six movies, but Ethan has also had many different faces in a much less literal way. The first three Mission Impossible movies make up one of the most tonally and stylistically diverse trilogies of films I think I've ever seen. If I didn't know any better, I would believe you if you told me that Mission Impossible 2 and 3 weren't even supposed to be Mission Impossible movies. They feel like completely standalone Tom Cruise action movies where they just changed the main character's name to Ethan Hunt and found a way to get Ving Rhames as Luther in there, the only true constant of this franchise. But of course, that wasn't the case. They just got three of the most different directors they could to make each of these three movies. And what we got as a result was a slow and steady thriller that plays out more like a mystery story than an action movie, a balls-to-the-wall action extravaganza with a a deep love for melodrama, slow motion, and absurd stunt work, and a dark and grounded tale with so much shaky cam the movie itself feels like it's about to split in half. And it's in these varying tones that three different Ethan Hunts were born, three different protagonists to match these three different tones, and I refer to them as such. Thinking Ethan, Showman Ethan, and Normal Ethan. 
Thinking Ethan is the product of Brian De Palma's slower and more deliberately paced spy thriller. Most of the movie's big moments with Ethan are built around him figuring things out, like how Job is a reference to the book in the Bible, or unraveling how Jim Phelps is the villain behind everything. As I said before, this first movie plays out more like a mystery than an action movie, and in that framework, Ethan himself would be playing the role of the detective, putting together the clues, and trying to catch the culprit, with the primary driving force of the plot being to to figure out who betrayed the IMF. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like a whodunit dressed like a spy movie, and so as a consequence, Ethan has to be a much more contemplative figure, much more athletically inclined than your typical Sherlock Holmes, but still more of a thinker than an action star. Someone who is more than capable of resolving most things with his words rather than his fists, doing a lot more talking to get out of bad situations than shooting. Someone whose central conflict isn't being shot at, but is instead figuring out who he can and can't trust struggling to separate who he wants to trust and who he shouldn't. And so, this Ethan spends most of his time thinking, progressing through the puzzle, taking the time to figure it out and plan accordingly, running through the clues, trying to make connections, using the visual language to guide us through his thought process rather than explaining it explicitly through expositional dialogue. And then, in Mission Impossible 2, we learn that Ethan Hunt likes to free climb big rocks and throw exploding sunglasses because he's a cool dude with long hair and a rockin' bod. This is Showman Ethan, with John Woo's specific brand of over-the-top ridiculousness mixed with a late 90s, early 2000s love for extreme sports, Ethan Hunt takes on a much louder persona. He's flirtatious and charming. He does gunplay that's hardly practical but does look really cool. His emotions are externalized and always very clear. He does this. You look that man in the eye and tell me he doesn't know exactly what he's doing. This is far removed from the quieter and more thoughtful Ethan of the first film. This is an obvious, one-dimensional, dramatic character whose struggles aren't as much about coming to terms with the people he cares about now being his enemies, but instead being as simple as who he cares about being in danger. He is a stock standard secret agent hero with few, if any, discernible qualities beyond being a cool guy who does cool things because it looks cool. A character whose only purpose is to put on an entertaining show for the audience at home, and so defies the most practical options in favor of the ones that are the most visually interesting. There's nothing cerebral here. There is no thinking, there is only doing. Because while Brian De Palma sought to make a concentrated spy thriller, a slow-paced and careful story centered around the emotional struggle of realizing the people in your life aren't who you thought they were, John Woo just likes excessively cool shit. And so Mission Impossible 2 is all about the melodrama, the overacting, the overstylization, and this version of Ethan was built to fit into those priorities. A true showman meant to wow the audience and match the absurd excess surrounding him. And don't get me wrong, I do find it highly entertaining, but there is absolutely nothing more to it than that. And finally, there's Mission Impossible 3, where J.J. Abrams boldly asked, what if Ethan Hunt was just like, a guy, and normal Ethan came to be. From a writing standpoint, the most distinct element of Mission Impossible 3 from its peers is its intense focus on the personal stakes for Ethan himself. The personal stakes are so important, in fact, that the movie makes it a point to not tell us what Ethan is even saving the world from. This is the first movie in the series where we get a sense of who Ethan is outside of the IMF. In a world completely separated from impossible missions, what is Ethan Hunt really like? And it turns out that he plays the role of a suburban husband rather well. Alongside his wife Julia, you wouldn't be able to guess that he's anything but a perfectly normal dude with a perfectly normal, boring job. This is someone you could actually know, someone with real emotions, and not just because of his much more regular surroundings in the film's first act. There is something very authentic about watching Ethan have to pretend that everything's fine just after he failed to save someone he really cared about. And that much more emotionally minded version of of Ethan fits much better in the darker and more grounded tone of this third film, built on an intensity found in the almost vulgar amounts of shaky cam and close-ups along with the much drabber color palette bringing it all down to earth. But the ultimate consequence of all of this is that Mission Impossible 3 comes off as… kind of basic. 
This movie was released in 2006, 10 years after Brian De Palma's first film, two years after The Bourne Supremacy and Paul Greengrass's notorious shaky cam style, one year after Batman Begins popularized the idea of the dark and gritty reimagining, and the same year as the reinvention of James Bond in Casino Royale. I bring all of this up because Mission Impossible 3 kind of feels like a big amalgamation of all of these elements. While the other major spy movie franchise was discovering new ground after decades of movies, Mission Impossible felt aimless after only a single decade. Like it was just chasing trends because no one knew what else to do with the series by that point. This Mission Impossible in particular had an incredibly troubled production cycle with directors and actors dropping off the project like flies. And I think a big part of that is simply because nobody could figure out what this series' identity was, and a big part of that was because no one really knew who Ethan Hunt was. Making him a normal guy feels on some level like they were trying to find his foundation. By separating him from the IMF, showing us who he is outside of that, I think they hoped to find the character beyond the secret agent. But that character is based so much on lies and deceit, even to the woman he supposedly loves more than anything. By trying to find the character outside the secret agent, they inadvertently revealed that there wasn't really much of one. Mission Impossible 3 is a movie that wears its heart on its sleeve and carries the emotional beats pretty well, with a nice Michael Guccino score helping it along and a standout performance from Philip Seymour Hoffman giving it some much needed character. But it is, in my opinion, the least inspired and arguably safest Mission Impossible movie. A third movie in a successful franchise made for the sake of having a third movie in a successful franchise. One that seemed to show that the lack of a clear identity for its hero was starting to become a real problem. And so, what we're left with is three stylistically distinct movies and three completely separate protagonists all going by the same name. None of these Ethan Hunts feel like they could even possibly be the same person. I don't believe this Ethan has ever motorcycle jousted in his life. I don't believe this Ethan would ever have made it past the Job thing. And I don't believe this Ethan would ever have held Philip Seymour Hoffman out of an airborne plane. So, the big question is... Where do you go from here? If you make a fourth movie, what do you do? How do you move forward? Well, I'll tell you how. You give the reins to Brad Bird, and he makes Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, the movie that reintroduced the franchise to a modern audience in 2011 and pushed the series to brand new heights by dangling Tom Cruise off the side of the tallest building in the world. And Ghost Protocol did something very interesting. It did something that no other Mission Impossible had done prior. It did this. Why was he in prison? He disappeared. After he and his wife, you know. It directly acknowledged a previous movie in the series. Before this, every Mission Impossible could have been taken as something completely standalone. Nothing crossed over into the other movies. And so, Ghost Protocol almost immediately sets itself up to be a sequel that's actually a sequel. This isn't standalone, this is progressing the story of Mission Impossible, the story of Ethan Hunt. And that meant there needed to be some consistency with how Ethan Hunt was characterized. There needed to be some way to believe believe that at least the Ethan from Mission Impossible 3 is the same Ethan we're seeing here. But Brad Bird and the film's writers did us not one, but two better, and found a way to combine all three Ethans into one. Now, you may be asking, how is that even possible? How could you combine such disparate personalities into one? Well, there is a simple explanation. You see, Ethan Hunt is fucking crazy. Crazy Ethan is the fourth and final Ethan Hunt, a version of Ethan that has remained fairly steady since Ghost Protocol, to the point where there is a plot point in both Rogue Nation and Fallout where someone says that Ethan Hunt might just be crazy and making things up, and it is not an entirely unbelievable prospect. And by making Ethan Hunt crazy, Ghost Protocol is able to mix together all of the different tones of the previous three movies, the tense thriller aspect of the first film, the unabashed absurd 
absurdity of the second and the more grounded character work of the third to create an identity that now, with two more movies under its belt and two more on the way, has become the identity of the franchise. While the visual styles of each movie may still differ greatly, the tones and character work have become much more consistent since number four, with more characters reappearing for multiple installments, storylines continuing in sequels, and of course, Christopher McQuarrie building on Ghost Protocol with Rogue Nation and becoming the captain of the franchise. And it all started here in Ghost Protocol with Crazy Ethan. And I think the best way to talk about how exactly it does this is to look at the film's most iconic set piece. The Dubai sequence in Ghost Protocol is my second favorite set piece in all of Mission Impossible. What is my first favorite? We'll get to it. Trust me, have some patience, okay? Jeez. But before we start dissecting this sequence, I need to bring you back to the olden days of middle school English and give you a lesson on characterization. Very, very broadly speaking, there are two types of characterization, direct and indirect. Direct characterization is when a text tells you something about a character directly, whether through a narrator or through one character making an observation about another. But what we're concerned with is indirect characterization, which basically embodies that old writing mantra of show don't tell. The basic idea is that it is, most of the time, better to convey information through action than through explicit exposition. And that's basically what indirect characterization is. Rather than telling us who a character is, we are allowed to infer who they are through action in context. And what I believe to be the most effective form of this is seeing what kind of decisions a character makes in specific situations. And that brings us back to the Dubai sequence in Ghost Protocol, which is effectively just a series of setups and payoffs built around the different decisions that characters make and how they deal with the consequences of those decisions. From the very first clear shot of the Burj Khalifa at around 53 minutes into the movie, all the way to when the sandstorm dissipates at around an hour and 22 minutes, this sequence is about 30 whole minutes. And it is split into three separate sections, the setting up of the plan, the execution of the plan, and the fallout of the plan when it all goes wrong. A lot of major Mission Impossible set pieces are structured like this even before Ghost Protocol, in a way existing as their own three-act stories within these larger three-act narratives. And in this sequence, each of these three sections can be viewed as representing one of the tones that came before Ghost Protocol, tying them all together through the indirect characterization of Ethan Hunt as he is forced to make decisions on the fly and adapt to shifting circumstances. The sequence is built on a simple plan. A man named Wistrom, who is working for a man named Hendrix, is having a meeting with an assassin named Moreau, who is selling Wistrom nuclear launch codes that Hendrix wants to use to cause a nuclear war between the US and Russia. The plan is for Ethan and his team to impersonate Wistrom and Moreau with masks in order to secure the actual codes while giving Wistrom fake ones coded in isotopes they can use to track Wistrom back to Hendrix. So, the purpose of the first section, the first act responsible for setting up the conflict and the characters' positions within that conflict, is to set up this ruse by getting control of the building's cameras and elevators, switching door numbers, and making the masks. The only problem is that in order to control the cameras and elevators, they have to get into the building's server room. And according to Benji, We're just gonna have to go into the server room from the outside. What? And the first major decision is made for Ethan Hunt to scale the outside of the Burj Khalifa in order to go through the outside window into the server room using slightly defective equipment. And it's this stunt, the biggest stunt of the movie used in much of the marketing, that puts this in the showman Ethan category for me. This first section, before there's any outward threats, is all about the big showy stunt and the natural tension that comes with watching it happen. Ethan falling from the tallest building in the world makes me gasp no matter how many times I see it. But Mission Impossible 3 also had a big showy stunt in it, so what makes this feel so much like 2 specifically? Well, it's in the fact that the stunt itself is kind of pointless, actually, at least from a plot perspective. The purpose of this stunt is mostly to hide setup within it. The opened window, the sandstorm, the goggles Ethan will use later in said sandstorm. But from a plot point of view, Ethan gets the job done, and then that's the end of that, and we just move on 
with the sequence without any real transition from one to the next. Unlike in the first or third movies, where the biggest practical stunts were key parts of the set piece itself, this is a roadblock that gets introduced mostly for the sake of giving us the visual of Tom Cruise hanging onto the side of this massive building. They could have so easily written this out by having Benji just hack in, and the movie would have changed very little. But this is a far more fun and memorable way to do all of those things I mentioned. And that sounds a lot like Mission Impossible 2, a movie that is all about finding excuses to get Ethan Hunt to do wild shit because it's just more fun that way. But it also serves to show that not only is Ethan capable of doing these things, he's also very willing to do them if he needs to. And then the second section starts as the plan begins to fall apart further and we dive head first into the central conflict of the sequence. Two things happen in quick succession. First, it turns out that Wistrom brought a friend along, a man named Leonid Lysenker, who is there to verify the codes, meaning that giving them fake codes won't work. And the second thing that happens is their mask making machine breaks down before it can finish the job, meaning they can't go in with disguises. And in response to these two events, Ethan makes two decisions that ultimately bring us to the same conclusion about his character. Not only are they going to go in without masks in the hope that these people haven't met before, but they're also going to give Wistrom an exact copy of the launch codes in the hope that they'll be able to catch him and Hendrix before they can use them. And what follows is a scene built on tension and tension alone, using only dialogue and precise editing to keep that tension high. No big stunts, no big action, just the threat of our villains not only catching on to our hero's trick, but also getting away with what they came for and endangering the entire world. And in this section, while still remaining our showman Ethan we saw before, he also becomes our thinking Ethan from the first movie. The movie focused mostly on building tension, especially during exchanges of dialogue where who someone really was, was a very difficult thing to gauge. While this Ethan may not be as much of a detective as the first movie's Ethan was, this is still a character who's very adept at talking his way out of situations rather than fighting or shooting. This is an Ethan capable of quickly thinking through all the different possibilities and finding the best, potentially only, option. But what makes this Ethan fit in with the showman Ethan is ultimately that common denominator between his two major choices, hope. This is an Ethan capable of thinking through all the options logically. We even saw a little bit of that during the first section as he tried to come up with other options besides essentially free climbing the Burj Khalifa. But it's also an Ethan who is willing to take the crazy plan that seems destined to fail because there is a chance, a hope, however slim, that it could work. This contrasted with the character of Brandt, who isn't willing to take that kind of chance at first, because it seems obvious that it's a bad idea to give the terrorist the nuclear launch codes that he's after. He'd rather let it play out and kill Wistrom. But Ethan demonstrates that this isn't exactly an impulse decision from him. You tell me that this is his only avenue right here, right now, today. You tell me that, I'll walk away. And because Brandt can't do that, he concedes. This Ethan is not only willing to do those wild things, not only capable of thinking things through enough to find the best option, he is also willing to recognize when the best option, the only real option, is also the craziest option. The option that others would never think to try, because he's willing to bet on hope. And sometimes, hope doesn't work out. In our third and final section, just like with a normal third act, the tension reaches a climax and all of our setups start getting paid off. Jane kicks Moreau out the open window, the sandstorm finally arrives, Ethan uses the goggles to traverse the sandstorm as he chases down Wistrom. He tracks him through the storm, gets hit by a car Wistrom is driving, steals a different car, crashes that car into the first car in a desperate bid to stop Wistrom from getting away with the codes, only for Wistrom to hop onto the back of a truck, peel off his mask, and reveal he was Hendrix the whole time, meaning that if Ethan had gone with Brant's plan to neutralize him instead, they would have gotten the man they were after, and he wouldn't have gotten away with the codes he's going to use to effectively destroy the world. And while it's small, I think this section is the one that best represents that normal Ethan, because it's the section where he's most desperate. The one where he's putting himself at the most direct physical risk because he knows what it means if he fails. And it's as he's slowing down, in the silence save the residual winds of the sandstorm, that Ethan Hunt fails. 
and that was a surprising rarity in Mission Impossible up to this point, because for as many times as the plan goes wrong, Ethan still often manages to find at least some success, and even when he doesn't, it's very rare that the failure was because of a decision he made. It's often because he was betrayed, or because the villain was just one step ahead. But this time, Ethan just made the wrong call. He made the best decision he could have made in the moment with the knowledge that he had, but he still made the wrong call. There's nothing that feels more like a normal person than that. Sure, it's not him being a husband and acting like a basic boring guy, but here is that vulnerability that makes him feel relatable and human. And that's how this all fits together. When we see a man capable of thinking it all through, who's still able to recognize when the craziest option is the best, but who is still able to fail, who is still able to make the wrong decision because he bet on hope, the possibility of the best ending, and lost. And it's that version of Ethan Hunt that I call Crazy Ethan. Because this Ethan Hunt represents a sort of radical idealism, an extremely anti-utilitarian mindset that says if you can't save every life, you may as well not save any. Ethan would bet it all on pushing the trolley off the tracks with his bare hands rather than let any single person die, and that's crazy. He will put himself through the ringer through great risk of physical harm to himself to try and save everyone he can even if it means opening up the chance that he could save no one. And that's something we've seen from Ethan before, when he got the rabbit's foot for Owen Davian in 3 because he wasn't willing to sacrifice his wife, when he chose to risk spreading a highly contagious disease in 2 based on the slim possibility that he could save Naya, when he chose to trust Claire in 1 even after he realized her husband was behind everything because he wanted to believe she was good. Ethan Hunt has, since the first Mission Impossible, been a character who bet on hope. And that is the foundation of Ghost Protocol's Crazy Ethan, the gambler who only ever goes all in, even after he loses everything. Just take for example the end of Rogue Nation, when after he's been outplayed at every turn by his villainous other half Solomon Lane, Ethan still takes one of the biggest gambles of the franchise. Rogue Nation is a movie built on the premise of pushing Ethan Hunt to his mental limits. While Ethan works best when the plan falls apart, Solomon Lane is a man who plans for absolutely everything, every possible contingency. He's a man nearly obsessed with creating a game only he can can win. But what he could never account for is a man like crazy Ethan. While Benji is strapped to a time bomb, Ethan bluffs that he has memorized the entire contents of the disc that Lane needs to fund his operations and destroyed the disc itself, meaning that if Benji blows up and takes Ethan with him, that information is gone. And of course this is a bluff, but this is the kind of action that Lane didn't account for in his possible contingencies. This is not a bluff you would ever expect someone to pull. So, if it is true, even if the possibility is slim, Lane won't have any way to access his money. So, he stops the bomb, and now Lane is playing by Ethan's rules, having to work without a real plan. But do you see what I mean by that being crazy? It is a choice so out of left field that even Solomon Lane couldn't have possibly predicted it. And that is Ethan Hunt's specialty, doing the thing that has so little chance of working, but if it does work, getting you exactly where you you need to go, even if it means that the fate of the world all comes down to the very last second. Because for Ethan Hunt, the ideal outcome is the only acceptable outcome. And while the Dubai sequence may be my second favorite set piece in all of Mission Impossible, I think it's my first that is the best representation of this idea. I love Mission Impossible Fallout. Not only is it my favorite movie in the franchise, so far at least, but it is also easily on the list of my favorite action movies of all time. And that's for a lot of reasons. The incredible hand-to-hand -hand fight scenes, the absolutely gorgeous cinematography by DP Rob Hardy, the wonderful score by Lauren Balfe, Rebecca Ferguson being the best damn thing to ever happen to this franchise. But what makes it stand out amongst the crowd, what puts it not only at the top of my list for this franchise, but also near the top of my all-timers is the fact that this is the only Mission Impossible movie that truly explicitly cares about who Ethan Hunt 
is. If Ghost Protocol tied all three of the Ethan Hunts together and Rogue Nation expanded on that new character by forcing him to face his dark reflection, then Fallout is the story that asks my favorite question for a story to ask. Why? After five movies, after saving the world five times at the very last second and probably countless more times than we've ever gotten to see, why does Ethan still do this? Just look at the opening of the film, the franchise's first ever dream sequence, the first ever direct look into Ethan's mind, where Ethan is being married to Julia, his wife from Mission Impossible 3 that we learn at the end of Ghost Protocol he had to help fake the death of because... As long as we're together, she can never be saved. But soon, the idyllic tone begins to slip away as the officiant, revealed to be Solomon Lane, starts to list all the reasons he shouldn't have this happiness, culminating in the line. In a selfish, futile, fleeting Stop. attempt to escape your own true self. An explosion goes off in the distance, the blast hurtling towards them, literally tearing them apart as Ethan wakes abruptly. And this establishes an internal conflict for Ethan that the entire movie ultimately comes to be about. What Ethan Hunt wants versus what he feels he needs to do. The type of life that he wants to live versus the consequences of having that life. And that internal conflict is front and center. The question of sacrifice, the concept of the greater good. The film's villain, John Lark, is a man who believes in the idea that there's never been peace without first a great suffering. The greater the suffering, the greater the peace. Basically the notion that good for the many only comes from the sacrifice of the relative few. And when Ethan Hunt is tasked with recovering three plutonium cores that Lark wants to use to bring about this great suffering, he is given a choice of sacrifice. Let his best friend die to secure the plutonium and the safety of millions, or save his best friend and let the plutonium be taken. And because there is that slim chance that Ethan can do both, he chooses to save Luther but is unable to secure the plutonium. That is what kickstarts the entire story. It is Ethan's unwillingness to sacrifice someone else's life that puts the world in danger. I think it's Hunley that puts it best. Some flaw deep in your core being simply won't allow you to choose between one life and millions. And we see that conflict within Ethan Hunt throughout the movie, particularly in the ways that Fallout gives us a window into what Ethan is thinking. While the first movie shows us Ethan thinking and guides us through his process, while Ghost Protocol has Ethan verbalize his thought process, Fallout gives us glimpses into Ethan's mind, into that internal conflict conflict as he's forced to make decision after decision to either make sacrifices or not. One of the best examples of this being his visualization of the plan to free Solomon Lane in order to trade him for the plutonium. The plan is to kill everyone, which prompts Hunt to consider this action from the perspective of him having to shoot an unarmed man, taking an innocent life in order to save the world, and that is unacceptable to him. This is a personal belief, something that he is completely unwilling to compromise for a so-called greater good, and he will always, always find a different way to get it done. But when it comes to himself, what he wants, what's best for him, he is more than willing to make those sacrifices. He sacrifices his relationship with Julia to keep her safe. He saves Agent Walker's life during the Halo jump, even though it puts him at much greater risk. He refuses to act on the feelings he obviously has for Ilsa because it would only mean the same thing it did for Julia. And so, while he refuses to make sacrifices that involve hurting other people, he's actively making sacrifices that involve hurting himself. And while he's forever haunted by the knowledge that he can never have the life he wants, he knows he would also be haunted by the knowledge that he's leaving the world unprotected from the likes of Solomon Lane or John Lark. So he chooses what he views as the greater good, sacrificing the part of himself that wants that life in order to keep the part of himself that will be there to save the world when he needs to. But while Ethan is here struggling with these internal conflicts, John Lark, revealed to be August Walker, has no such problem. Lark is completely single-minded in his pursuit. He knows exactly who he is, what he wants, and how to get it. Someone like Lark isn't burdened by any conflicting desires or beliefs or distractions, 
and he remains ahead of Ethan at almost all times because he's willing to do whatever it takes to succeed in his mission, while Ethan is consistently stuck trying to reconcile these seemingly incompatible parts of himself. Fallout calls into question that one core aspect of Ethan Hunt's identity, perhaps the one consistent quality he has always had. Ethan Hunt wants to save everyone, even if it means potentially saving no one. But this movie questions if it's even really possible to save everyone. When faced with someone as single-minded and willing as John Lark, will trying to save everyone be the reason that Ethan Hunt saves no one? And this all comes to a head in my favorite set piece in all of Mission Impossible. The setup is simple. John Lark and Solomon Lane now have two of the plutonium cores and have gone to Kashmir in India in order to create two bombs with them that will, by poisoning the largest natural irrigation system in the world, starve a third of the human population. And disarming them is nearly impossible because disarming one will cause the other to go off. The only way to do it is by removing the firing key on the bomb's remote detonator, shorting out the failsafe, and allowing them to cut the fuses. Only thing is that they can't do that until the bomb's timers have already started, so they're going to be on one hell of a strict time limit. It's a very difficult situation, made only more difficult by the fact that Lark has set things up to where Julia is at the exact place that bombs are while all of this happens. That thing Lark interprets as Ethan's greatest weakness, the representation of that internal conflict that keeps Ethan from doing what's necessary. And what follows is the same sort of three-act structure we had with the Dubai sequence. Just a slight bit more chaotic because there's not that much of an actual plan this time. The first act, what would be setting up the plan, begins with everyone searching for the detonator and the bombs. They manage to find one and leave Luther to start the disarming process while they go search for the rest of the items, finding the detonator close by as John Lark gets on a helicopter and flies away with a second one in tow carrying a large payload. And Ethan, in an attempt to follow, jumps onto the payload and begins climbing the rope up to the helicopter because, as we've established, this man is insane. Ilsa and Benji continue searching for the other bomb, but Luther is having trouble disarming the first bomb by himself, and the person who shows up to help him is Julia. Luther, get her out of there! Where is she gonna go? What can I do? Meanwhile, Ethan manages to climb up into the helicopter, dispatch those inside, and start trying to fly it, his head now racing as he tries to figure out what to do now that he's there. You find the bomb, I'll get the detonator. I won't let you down. Ethan loses radio contact with the others as we learn that he doesn't actually know how to fly a helicopter, apparently, but he knows well enough to get above Lark's helicopter to try and drop his payload on them. But all he does is miss and make Lark aware of his presence, resulting in a chase through the valley and into the mountains while Ilsa finds the other bomb, but is ambushed by Lane and tied up. And now that everything and everyone are in their places and the action is ramping up, we enter the second act of the set piece where the central conflict truly begins. Ethan and Lark duel in their helicopters with Ethan as desperate as he has ever been, trying to ram into Lark's helicopter with his own. Benji finds Ilsa and starts to fight Lane, but he seems hopelessly outmatched, only for Ilsa to free herself in the coolest way imaginable and start fighting Lane herself, all while Ethan's helicopter engine begins to catch fire as he's chasing Lark and the time on the bombs continues to tick down. Ethan manages to succeed in ramming Lark's helicopter, causing them both to crash, and Ilsa manages to beat Lane and save Benji, leaving them to start disarming the second bomb. The two helicopters become stuck in a large vertical crevice, hot oil burning Lark's face as they fall down onto a large cliff. And finally, the tension reaches its climax as we enter our third act. Ethan faces off with Lark while the rest of the team focuses on the bombs with no way of knowing if Ethan has the detonator or not. It's a battle of what these two men have come to represent, the man willing to sacrifice as much as is needed versus the man who isn't willing to sacrifice anyone. They engage in a vicious back and forth with the detonator sitting precariously on the very edge of the cliff until the two men roll off the side, hanging onto the rope from the payload that's keeping one of the helicopters in place with the hook stuck in the rock above. Both Ethan and Lark start trying to climb the cliff face only for Ethan to realize that the rope and the hook attached to it are loose. So he pulls on the rope, the metal hook plummets past him into the head of John Lark, leaving Ethan with one last thing to prove. 
As the countdown continues, Ethan climbs upwards slowly, bleeding and exhausted from all he's had to do over the past several days, perhaps even all he's had to do over all these many years. Both bombs are successfully set up to be disarmed, but once again, they have no way of knowing if Ethan succeeded or not. Both Ilsa and Benji are afraid he hasn't, but Luther is adamant that he'll get it done. And as they get down to the last 15 seconds, they make the decision to hope that he has it. While Ethan keeps climbing towards it, the timer ticks down to one. They both cut the wires and... Silence. The bombs are safely disarmed, Ethan pulls himself up onto the cliff, and everyone is saved. At the literal, very last second, everyone is saved. I think Mission Impossible speaks to a very specific kind of wish fulfillment. The notion that no matter how bad things get, no matter how hopeless things seem, how impossible it feels to succeed, it's not over until it's over. The idea that nothing is truly impossible if you commit yourself to it fully and believe totally in your ability to do it. That the ideal is never out of reach if you just believe that it's possible. And I think this sequence is the best representation of that in the entire series. Because there's no other point in the series where I felt this uncertain about our hero's fate. There was obviously a part of me that knew they would get out alright, that they would manage it somehow. But I think the thing that Mission Impossible does better than perhaps any other franchise like it is make you believe, if only for a moment, that they may not. To make the situation feel so impossible to escape that you can't help but wonder just a little bit if they will. There's an uncertainty there that the movie has been building from the beginning. An uncertainty as to whether or not Ethan and his team can truly save everyone without sacrificing anyone. An uncertainty as to whether or not Ethan Hunt's way of doing things who he is can truly be the right way to do it. And yet, it is because Ethan Hunt never compromised on that part of who he is never stops fighting until the very last second to save everybody that he manages to actually do it. And who were core parts of making sure it worked out but the two people he tried to push out of his life, Julia and Ilsa. The two people he tried to sacrifice his own desires to keep safe who here refuse to let him do so because he needs them. He needed that part of himself too. In that brief moment of silence before the white revealed itself as the light of the sun, there was an uncertainty. But in the silence, in the question, there was also a hope. And I think it's in that moment of silence that the identity of Ethan Hunt and Mission Impossible becomes clear. It was somewhat difficult to make this video, honestly, because I didn't know how to talk about this series. It wasn't that long ago I watched these movies for the very first time, and I loved them, but I didn't really know why exactly. All I really knew was that I connected to something in it. I just didn't know what. And I think more than anything, it was that uncertainty. It was the seemingly unstable nature of this franchise and of this character, but it was also the hope, the belief that I knew it. I understood it. I felt it, even if I couldn't put it all into words. I think there's this strange idea that if you can't describe something, if you can't communicate a feeling or an idea or a belief, that thing isn't real. It isn't true. If you don't know something completely, if you aren't 100% sure, then you don't know it at all. And I don't believe that. Within the idea of show don't tell, the concept of indirect characterization is a gap, however small, of uncertainty. The question of whether or not your understanding is accurate. And I think, perhaps contradictorily, that uncertainty is the key to a true intimacy. The knowledge of that gap, the lack of total understanding, is what it means to know a work of art or to know a person. Because art should not tell you anything. It should not be given that level of authority over its audience. Rather, should a work stand equal with its audience. Art is a conversation, 
not a lecture. It's a relationship, a shared journey of emotion and discovery. The truth is that people are infinitely more complex than can be totally expressed through artistic craft. No level of characterization, no use of narrative structure can completely encapsulate the infinite complexities of a human personality. A person is not just one thing. And the attempt to congeal all of our many contrasting qualities into a sensible whole is futile. There will always be another conflict, another contradiction. Every individual is a messy cluster of confusion, a combination of our environments and our relationships and our experiences and perhaps some other inconceivable quality. We are a mixture and sifting through that mixture to find every part of what makes it up is an endless pursuit. It is truly impossible to know all of who we are, but it is a pursuit worth chasing to the very last second. The identities of Ethan Hunt and Mission Impossible have always seemed unstable from the outside, but I think there is a strange intimacy between this series and those who love it, an understanding born in that space of uncertainty and the willingness to embrace a lack of precise definition, a willingness to embrace the multitudes within us, the parts of ourselves that want to be happy with the people we love, and the parts of ourselves that contradict that yearning. It'll probably be messy, trying to keep it all together, trying to accept all of who you are. It certainly has been for Ethan Hunt. But he will go on another adventure, he will fight his way through it until that last second, and he will somehow find a way to do the impossible. And he will always reach that brief moment of silence, hanging from a cliff face and watching the gorgeous skyline ahead. That moment when everything makes sense and nothing needs to be said. Because who we are lies not in what we can say, but in what we can't. Identity lies in silence. 